On December 27, 2022, after considerable pushback about the ill-timed opening of a public hearing on inclusionary zoning, Ridgefield's Planning and Zoning Commission opened a public dialogue on new so-called inclusionary zoning regulations in all zones within Ridgefield that would mandate that 15% of units in developments of four or more units must be low-income restricted units. Thanks to Ridgefielders who took time from their holidays to email the commission, including John Tartaglia, who included business analysis, Dr. Mary Flynn McGuire, Charlie Irwin, Theresa Cohart, yours truly Kirk Carr, Chris Cohart, Richard Larson, Linda Lavelle, Tim Balinskis, and first selectman Rudy Marconi. A dedicated public hearing has been scheduled for January 25th. Please mark your calendar and plan to attend either in person or via Zoom. Chair Hendrick explains the inconvenient opening two days after Christmas this way. Uh, in quick summary, the, and the bottom line of these was asking us to uh, continue the public hearing or, or postpone the public hearing uh, to January uh, to be past the holidays. Our intention was to open it, open the public hearing today because we have a regular meeting today and our intention is to keep the public hearing open into January. And we certainly anticipated that because of the holidays, it would be, and also because of the complexity of the topic, that uh, we, we absolutely intend as a commission to keep the public hearing open. But we, we also, we thought it was important to open the public hearing uh, because opening the public hearing legally allows us to actually begin a dialogue. But if scheduling this on December 27th didn't inconvenience the public enough, then Chairman Hendrick did this. Um, I'd like to ask unanimous consent of the members present to actually, um, actually, actually revert order of the public hearings. So we take 3.1.3 on the agenda and put that first. I'll ask for unanimous consent to, uh, to reverse the order of the public hearings. Is there any opposed? All right, without any objection, we'll just we'll just reverse and I'll proceed first to item 3.1.3. And so Mr. Hendrick moves the topic of greatest interest with over 20 interested citizens logged in to instead favor an application with one person applying for a special permit for a Mexican restaurant and the commission's application for revised parking rate regulations in the central business district which appears to have little public interest, while the public has to wait to weigh in almost two hours. All right, next item, which uh, I think was the, probably the one that did have a lot of interest tonight, uh, item 3.1.1. This is uh, application A-22-5. A-22-5 is um, a regulation amendment uh, uh, regarding inclusionary zoning. This regulation has been uh, initiated by the commission. Okay, so uh, open the public hearing at eight sixteen p.m. We'll let we'll do a commission presentation real quick first, and we've done this conversation in August and September and October already. So I'll try to do it quickly. To spare the commissioners. I'll I'll spend I'll try to do it in five or seven minutes. Kind of a quick run through of this presentation, which again the commissioners have gone through before. Mr. Hendrick promises to be brief in deference to the commission, not the public. And then instead of five to seven minutes, takes 23 minutes to basically say just this. Okay, so we have, our regulation is kind of relatively simple, really. Basic requirement, um, all applications for development, which result in the creation of four or more dwelling units, shall designate a minimum of 15% of the total number of dwelling units in a matter such at, that the units would qualify to be counted as either assisted housing or set aside development as defined in section 8-30G of the Connecticut General Statutes. So two hours after the public hearing is open and its order reversed and the chairman filibusters with a needlessly lengthy presentation, the public starts to burst their bubble. Hi, my name is Tracy O'Connor. I live at 59 Prospect Street. Um, and I, I have a question about, two questions, but this one, you, you're talking about inclusionary zoning. Um, is there a reason that it doesn't 
um, include ADA accessible uh, in any of these? Is that part of the inclusionary piece or not? Like, shouldn't units have one ADA accessible or elderly accessible? Good, good question. Um, I'm, uh, I want to make sure I get pulled to the right language just so that uh, we answer the I question. believe it's a building requirement, is it not? It's yeah, sorry, it's a number. building requirement. The 8-30G statute, Alice, you can help me along the way as I kind of, I'm trying to get the right term, but. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Well, that was my question. Uh, shouldn't high density or housing include those members of the public um, as well as affordable? That was my question. I just uh, briefly, uh, uh, I'm sure you read the two letters and the number of letters. Your public notice uh, refers generally to a text you've referred to tonight as uh, this is a conversation, this is a rough draft. I think the uh, uh, item under the uh, uh, filing is called a rough draft. I'm not understanding exactly what your public hearing is uh, encompassing. Are you uh, saying in your public notice that what you're uh, noticing uh, for this meeting is, well, we're thinking of discussing a draft, and uh, although I, uh, Mr. Hendrick, have uh, drafted a mandatory regulation, uh, we're not thinking about that. We're just thinking about the concept. Uh, precisely what was your public notice on? And are you notifying the public that it is uh, let's assume that your third draft is legal. It is your third draft that your commission is uh, considering as the draft uh, uh, that the public is bound by. That is, uh, that's all that's going to be discussed in the meeting. Uh, or is, the, is this uh, just a general discussion, which means you're going to have to have another meeting and another public mo uh, notice before you pass it into law? Uh, if if that's, uh, if that's the end of the question, the uh, simple answer is that our notice is, uh, is inclusive of the entire file, which is on, which is on view per, viewpoint cloud. It's, a, it's actually refer, referenced on the public notice. And yes, the third draft of the regulation itself, which I've just gone through and presented in the meeting, that is the draft which we're proposing since this is a friendly uh, a, amendment, it's commission initiated, uh, we could certainly discuss changes uh, and edits to that draft. And we expect, frankly, Mr. Tartaglia, uh, over a couple of meetings to make some minor changes. We, we had been discussing it, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the meeting, we had been discussing this in some drafts. We got to a point in a draft where we felt that the draft was uh, near finished, uh, in our opinion, or, or definitely getting close, and we want it was time for wider input. So we're taking wider input on the on the third draft. You keep uh, and all of the members of this commission seem to uh, be saying, "Well, we're doing what's good for Ridgefield." I haven't heard one item of evidence, one evidentiary submission, one economic analysis, one uh, actual factual uh, uh, discussion about this town, its needs its specific needs, specific parcels that you intend to be speaking of, or anything else of specificity sufficient for me to respond, except to indicate that uh, uh, I think you're generally uh, going in the wrong direction with uh, essentially mandating uh, the control of a means of production, uh, which is everybody in Ridgefield's uh, essential wealth, uh, except uh, for perhaps 30 people uh, is uh, maybe 50. Uh, is essentially uh, real estate, what they own, uh, their homes or related. Uh, I think that you're uh, taking control and mandating a means of production. I'm not uh, at all understanding how you're doing that in the residential zones, A, double A or triple A. I, I'm not understanding how uh, uh, your proposed zone uh, somehow extends to every zone in the town. Uh, uh, especially the majority, I guess it's about 60, 70 percent, maybe more, that uh, are single family residential. Uh, and if they're not affected by your regulation, I'm not at all satisfied in any presentation that 
you've not included that in your uh, mandate. And uh, quite frankly, your mandate seems to be creating or limiting property rights of people. And I'm not understanding how you're having the power uh, to do that, especially in light of a fee that, as near as I calculated, was about $425,000 uh, uh, per unit. I, I, I'm not quite understanding it. Uh, perhaps I didn't understand your wording. I did provide detailed commentary on it. I did provide uh, specific questions. Uh, you don't seem to have addressed any of them, and it's your prerogative. Uh, but uh, I, I submit by uh, 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 your lack of specificity, Mr. Uh, Hendrick, and your, uh, uh, I, in my opinion, uh, uh, not a, a really thorough or fair presentation of what you're intending to do, I think you've deceived the public, and I, I think you haven't... Uh, properly uh, uh, set forth precisely uh, what the level of control you're proposing within a planning and zoning commission. I, I don't think you've uh, thought it out well, and I ask you very strongly to uh, really reconsider the mandatory uh, aspect of that and uh, uh, shut away from it. I think it's a mistake. Uh, I, I understand you may have all good intentions, but I the reasons why uh, this presentation is woefully lacking. Uh, but at the moment, uh, my uh, uh, biggest objection is uh, you don't have the power to uh, to change the property rights of the people of the town. That's well, it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Your points are all um, are all heard. I'm going to make it a, a lot of tit for tat, but uh, just to be very clear, because as Mr. Tartaglia's main point, which you repeated some several times is whether or not the Planning and Zoning Commission has the power. The Planning and Zoning Commission is specifically enabled, uh, specifically empowered uh, to do exactly what we're doing here uh, under Section 8-2I of the Connecticut General Statutes. So, right, we're mandated to do it. Yeah. I was saying. That's that's a that's actually I was getting to that next. We we're we're we're, uh, we're allowed, permitted, uh, enabled, empowered, whatever word you want to use. We're empowered to enact inclusionary zoning regulations by eight two i. We are separately, as Mr. Katz is about to say, we separately have a state mandate, whether or not we like it <laughs> as a as a town, whether or not any individual likes it. We have a mandate to. Oh to progress, to make progress uh, in the direction of affordable housing, of increasing affordable housing in our community. We are mandated to do that under several other sections of the Connecticut General Statutes, including 8-30J, uh, not G. <laughs> J is the section that actually requires us to have an affordable housing plan, uh, which I know we've had a lot of conversation as a community over the last year about that creating the plan. Um, and 8-30G, which is the one that's most famous, um, actually essentially makes it so that if we don't keep up with that mandate, that then developers have the ability to, um, as many people say, do virtually what they want in terms of development in the community. This is Mary Flynn McGuire. I... There you are. Go ahead, Ms. McGuire. Uh, I've been in town since 1987, raised our family here, and um, the point of my email, when you mentioned, Mr. Hendrick, that you've been discussing this since September, October, November, I don't know how I would have known that, whatever, so I honestly don't know how the public, uh, like me, should have been informed. Um, so the point of my email to you all, first point was that this uh, discussion be held later, away from the holiday season, away from Christmas, away from Hanukkah, away from families not even being here in town. So unfortunately, we were the third topic to be discussed, and you gave a very good explanation and background, Mr. Hendrick, because I truly knew very little about this. Um, but that was about an hour and 20 minutes ago. So if this were to go the way I had intended, it, this was not going to be continued, but what you so eloquently discussed or, or informed us would have occurred at the next meeting, so everybody could be hearing it. 
So I'd hate to say to you, please repeat it. But if I had not heard that tonight, I would be, you know, not have the knowledge I now have. So that was one thing. I did not intend, I was not requesting that this be continued. I was requesting that it be moved to a convenient date in January, February, whenever. Um, the other was that it not be in Zoom. This is just so impersonal. You can't even see me. I can see you all. Um, and of course, if we got a really good turnout, because if everybody really knew what was being discussed, I have a feeling you'd have more than 23 public members or whatever I saw up there before. Um, so Zoom, to, and I do Zoom for many meetings, but Zoom for this very important meeting to me is not really appropriate. And then my very last point that I had mentioned was, uh, please make sure you do not vote tonight. And it seems that you're not, and I appreciate you hearing that. Um, but I, I strongly feel it needs to be later. It needs to be in a public forum, face to face, and um, let us continue the discussion. So maybe I could ask just one question and I will be done. How would I have known about all of this if I wasn't quote unquote hanging out on the town website? Uh, you you wouldn't, uh, Ms. Clinton. Actually, that's I, I know you know um, I know you have a different viewpoint on it, but um, we had some discussion about this when we scheduled it, and um, we we believe that it was important to 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 begin the public hearing specifically so that we could make this notice so that people could start to pay attention because otherwise we'd have to wait and do public notice okay. holidays. And public notice, by the way, has to be done several weeks before the actual hearing. So we did public notice a number of weeks ago. So it's, it's a quite a long process. And we decided it would be better to put the community on alert early and have the conversation, which definitely will last more than one meeting. But we thought it was better to start early rather than to continue and delay and, and push the can down the road and not have the conversations that we elected to, to put the sure. can no, I, I appreciate that. But how would I know? How would I know about the public notice? Do I have to subscribe to the Ridgefield Press in order to know about public notice, or do emails? And I'm, I sincerely mean that. Do Whether emails go out from Rudy Marconi, said, stating that these are the public notices? That's a good, it's actually a really good point, one that we have discussed also in our commission. Well, by the way, it would be another regulation amendment similar to this, where um, we have we have discussed the fact that uh, it, that you know, right now, right now our regulations are written so that public notice is in the newspaper of record, which is the Ridgefield Press. And there's definitely some conversation uh, amongst the public, but also the commissioners that we should have, we should allow for other means of valid public notice. Okay, next person is Kurt Carr. I, I'm really not sure what problem you're trying to solve except this uh, 830G mandate, as uh, has been mentioned earlier. If there was no 830G, what problem would you be solving? Uh, you would, there is no problem to solve. Ridgefield has about 9,000 households. 2% of our population is in poverty. Um, if you took that 2% and you, you applied it, that's about 180 households in poverty. If you gross it up, 50% uh, to 3%, uh, that would be 270 households. We have 284 low income restricted units in Richfield already. Um, there, is, there is not an addressable market for low income housing that isn't already addressed either. And this is the other thing, that's only counting uh, income restricted housing. Uh, we don't know how much naturally occurring affordable housing there is. And the problem with 830G is no matter how low the, the rent is on a property, whether it's a accessory dwelling unit or it's an apartment, unless it's income restricted, it's not affordable by definition. Um, and so you're rushing down this path to create a lot more inclusionary or low income restricted housing. Um, and I listened to your presentation last time, and this is modeled after Darianne. Uh, Darianne and Ridgefield are two very different towns. The, uh, Darianne is, in the last 10 years, has grown twice as fast 
as Ridgefield. It's projected to grow another 10% over the next 20 years, while Ridgefield is expected, is, is projected to actually decline in population. So the needs are very, very different. I don't know whether any of you looked at the video that I sent in that had a tour of the inclusionary zoning in uh, Darien, but it should scare you. I know that it, I think the people in Darien have been very surprised about how that has materialized. And I don't think there's anybody on the Planning and Zoning Commission who would want to see that kind of development in Ridgefield. Um, the, their planning and zoning, uh, their inclusionary zoning, as I understand it, is an overlay zone. What you have planned is in all, all zones in Ridgefield. Um, I think there are places in Ridgefield that you might want to uh, experiment. You already have, and I heard Mr. Katz say that he, he thought that the uh, incentives were an abysmal failure. Um, so why don't we try the mandates in just those areas and see if that's any better. And why do you think those are abysmal failures? You think the developers are just cheap? No, the reason is there's not an addressable market for low income restricted housing that isn't already addressed. They could build a lot of inclusionary housing and you know, gross up the cost of the rent on the, um, on the market rate units and, and still make a profit except for one thing, they couldn't fill the low income inclusionary units or they'd have great difficulty doing it. And what they fill it with, if they were able to fill it, could be very problematic for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so if, if I were you, I would proceed with great caution. Um, you're a fair, I, not trying to be um, insulting in any way, but you're a fairly green commission. Uh, four of you have been on the commission for a year. Your chairman has been a chairman for a year. Rushing off to do something this sweeping, this early in your terms, is just not necessary and experiment a little bit. If mandates work, in B1, 2, and 3, then think about expanding it if you want to. But I, I think that, that you may find this backfires, that developers, instead of saying, oh, this is much better than 830G, thank you very much, they may say, well, you've now made it impossible for us to build anything because of these inclusionary requirements. And I don't think that's what you intend. That would be unintended consequences. So I would really, and I, I hope you do have another public hearing, because I'd like to have a discussion with you face-to-face -face rather than on Zoom. I'm not back in town on the 3rd, so I hope you do uh, uh, continue this at least to the 17th, and, um, and that you give this. You know, you started the, the presentation at your last meeting saying this was a no-brainer. This is not a no-brainer. This is very serious, and you ought to really think about it very, very carefully. And if the only reason you're doing this it's because of something that Mr. Katz has described as a bugaboo, which is 830G, then you may be doing the wrong thing for a bad reason. And I'll leave it at that so Mr. Katz can maybe go to bed soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Any, uh, any further conversation or questions from Mr. Carr before we let him go? Mr. Katz usually wants to ask me a question. I know. Uh, that's the was closed. By the way, Here's it's not appropriate. What's appropriate is to move this forward. Thank you, Mr. Carr. I'm sure we'll uh, see you in uh, January. Okay, thank you. Who's next? Mr. Larson? Yes, he should be there in just a second. You know, I actually chaired a uh, Ridgefield committee in the past, and know uh, when I was uh, uh, chairing it, I worked on it uh, seven days a week. So I understand you know, the time commitment you're all uh, making on this. Uh, I understand the you know the two broad prongs of this uh, uh, proposal you know multi-unit versus uh, single unit. I had uh, two or three comments on that, uh, some of which I outlined in my uh, email. Uh, first is um, as uh, has been mentioned before, it does seem to be that it would apply uh, any place in Ridgefield. And uh, at least to my understanding, one of the better practices of uh, affordable housing is to locate it near uh, 
areas with uh, good transportation. So the notion that we could apply this anywhere in Ridgefield doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. So to me, I would like to see the amendment modified to be specific as to where and how that could be applied. The uh, second issue is uh, multi-house, multi-unit versus single unit developments. I understand uh, how it works in multifamily. We've seen that work in Ridgefield before. You know, it's, it can be a significant, significant number of units. Uh, some of them are affordable, they're all the same, nobody cares, and it all works just fine. On the other hand, uh, I struggle to see how that's going to work in a small uh, single unit uh, development. So what's a developer to do? Is he, he's going to build six houses, uh, a couple of them are, have to be uh, affordable. So what does he do? Does he make them all uh, smaller houses, uh, more intense density uh, so that he can do that? Uh, or does he plan to build uh, what they normally plan to do, which is very expensive houses, and have to figure out what to do with the one or two that he has to make affordable? It just doesn't seem to be workable. I, could, I, mean, I understand the multifamily thing. Uh, uh, it can work, has worked. Uh, I really don't see how the, uh, the, the single unit uh, idea works, and I would uh, strike that if I uh, had my wishes. <clears throat> Third point is, um, there's a lot of discussion about discretionary uh, ability of planning and zoning to decide to approve or not approve, especially as related to the uh, single unit housing development. You know, it, it seems like the uh, planning and zoning could do this, could do that, could not do this, could not do that. I don't see how that helps. Uh, a developer decide what to do. And I think there should be clarity, a lot more clarity on what those criteria would be if you really want to pursue the, uh, uh, that piece. So to me, um, I would be fine if we just left it at 830G and did not pursue this amendment. If we do pursue it, I would like to see it limited to multifamily uh, units and have specificity as to where uh, it would and will not apply uh, in Ridgefield. So in closing, thanks again for your work. I know how much it works it takes. Uh, annoying to get input from people that are only uh, you know, partially involved, but uh, I hope you give this uh, another round of consideration. Take out the single unit, uh, specify where the multifamily units uh, issues would be uh, specified. Um, and if, and if you don't want to do either of those two, just uh, don't do it. 830G might be uh, enough. Thanks a lot. Mr. Larson, um, I really appreciate it. I mean, th these, th you're, you really focused on the couple issues that frankly we also focused on and kind of had some debate and this is what we wanted to, wanted to hear <laughs> from people um, so that we weren't doing this in a, in a bubble. So it's good to, good to hear. So the commission continues the public hearing on inclusionary zoning. What, what do you think, folks? Um, is there any objection to setting a special meeting? Uh, Alice, I don't know if we have notice requirements. We probably have to think about that. Um, probably the soonest would be about the 25th of January for a special meeting. A month is about the time needed to do the two notices. So we will continue this, meet, this public hearing um, at a, date, at a special meeting date to be determined. Please mark your calendar for the next public hearing on inclusionary zoning that will be in person and face to face on Wednesday, January 25th. Come and share your thoughts on new mandatory inclusionary zoning regulations now proposed for all zones within Ridgefield, including the neighborhood where you and your family lives. What should planning and zoning consider? before revising its existing inclusionary zoning incentives in zones B1, B2, and B3, and instead mandating 15% 830G qualified low-income restricted units in all residential developments of four or more units, both single and multifamily developments in all zones within Ridgefield, following the Darien model. If the addressable market for such units is already saturated, Mandates could backfire 
and stunt the development of all market rate housing in Ridgefield, including unrestricted, naturally occurring affordable units. Best practices locate such housing near transportation not spread across 34 square miles of a town like Ridgefield. Applying these regulations to all zones within Ridgefield threatens residential neighborhoods, including single-family developments, defies common sense. Reserving too much latitude to the commission creates ambiguity and lacks clarity. If Ridgefield's inclusionary zoning developments materialized here, it would be very detrimental to Ridgefield's neighborhoods and to its quality of life. Darien is a very different town, with one-third the land area, two-and-a-half time Ridgefield's density, double Ridgefield's poverty rate, and a mainline Metro North station. A30G is, as Mr. Katz has explained, a bugaboo. Trying to appease the 830G guides with mandatory 830G units in all zones within Ridgefield will have unpredictable negative consequences. If planning and zoning wants to improve affordable housing for everyone in Ridgefield, erase 830G from your mind. It's a bugaboo. Keep any so-called inclusionary zoning based on incentives, not mandates. Restrict the expansion of any so-called inclusionary zones to an overlay zone in a transit-oriented community district, such as around the Branchville Station, and require any high-density developers to defray the infrastructure cost to the full extent permitted by law. This is Kirk Carr. On the record, thank you for watching.